Welcome back to another UFC fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the main card fights for UFC 225, Whitaker vs. Romero 2. A lot of interesting matches on this card, a card I've looking, been looking forward to predicting. So let's not waste any more time and let's get into the predictions. So in our first fight on the main card, we have in the welterweight division, CM Punk vs. Mike Jackson. A bit of a circus style fight, both 0-1, both lost to Mickey Gall. One's supposed to be a grappler. And one's supposed to be a boxer. Neither of them really got to show it. Mike Jackson got dropped by Mickey Gall. They both lost to Mickey Gall. Mike Jackson is supposed to be a boxer or has some boxing background. Backed up with his chin down. I mean, his chin up, hands down, square, and got dropped by Mickey Gall, who's really not known for his striking, not known for his power. And he do dropped him, submitted him via rear neck choke. Both fighters got submitted by Mickey Gall via rear neck choke in the first round. CM Punk lasted a little bit longer, so he could say he got the win, at least in, he lasted longer against Mickey Gall than... Mike Jackson did. And also, let's just say, I haven't seen Michael Jackson really show on any point, like really focus on training or getting better. He's been talking a lot on Twitter, watching a lot of fights and just talking, calling out CM Punk. But we haven't really seen any hard training or him really showing any dedication. It seems like CM Punk, despite being the star already in the WWE, he's still the one training harder, one focus harder, still trying to get better. He might not be looking world class, but his dedication is something to respect. To go from being a big star on one scene to go to being like a pretty much the scene is like a a comedic act in the, in like the fighting scene in the UFC that takes a lot of balls and you got to respect that and all the people that have been around him saying he's trying harder he's getting better and even before he actually had his first fight people say his grappling was pretty respectable I'm not saying it's world class but it's respectable from what I seen from Michael Jack Mike Jackson I haven't seen anything that's too respectable about his his skill set. He's respectable by getting in it. And like it's, it's to be respected that he's getting into the cage and fighting. But outside of that, there's not really much that I've seen to be impressed about him. And I think that's what's going to come down to the fight. Who wants it more? CM Punk, despite being a star in one, in one lane, he's coming over here and trying to start from the, pretty much the bottom up, trying to scratch his way in and get as much skills as he could get up. Whereas uh, Mike Jackson is really trying to ride his ride CM Punk's name and potentially get an easy win or the only win he could possibly get in the UFC is CM Punk. So that's where he's chasing that fight like desperately and he's getting that fight now. And I think that's just going to be where it's going to go. He's going to get the fight and I think CM Punk's going to beat him. I think the first round going to be a filling out process. I think CM Punk still very green, definitely green. 0-1, not much time in the octagon, hasn't had any success in octagon. He was completely dominated in the first, his first fight, his first loss. 0-1, only fight. So it's going to be a filling out process. CM Punk might have a difficulty getting to the ground early. But I feel maybe towards the end of the first round, he'll get him down. And then the second round is going to be a more of a filling out process. And I see him getting a takedown and getting a submission in the second round. Grappler versus striker. Two very green people around the same skill set. I'm going to go with the grappler in the matchup. And CM Punk is supposed to be the better grappler. So in this fight, I have CM Punk via second round submission. Then on to our next fight on the main card, we have in the heavyweight division, Andre Arlovsky versus Ty Tuivasa. A battle of the old versus the new. Andre Arlovsky was the heavyweight champion, i say, more than 10 years ago. And Ty Tuivasa is of the new guard. Some people saying the next Mark Hunt. And I definitely think he could be a good prospect and a future star in the heavyweight division. Might already be a star to some. And he's certainly building his name up. This is a huge step up for him. His last two opponents were definitely not the caliber that Andre Arlovsky was. But he didn't really struggle with them, ran through both opponents. I think his aggressiveness can like factor against him if he fights the same way as he did against those other opponents because he runs in a lot of times. He might have good boxing before he rocks him. We see somebody hurt. A lot of times he runs in too much behind like and smothers his own punches trying to knock somebody out. But he has a lot of good danger he's like he has a lot of good tools to hurt you with on the feet. He has knees, he has good hard leg kicks, has elbows, has heavy hands, so and he's actually despite his frame He's very light on his feet. So it's like daily fighter right there. Andre Lasky has good boxing, good sambo, well-rounded fighter. Ali has pretty like legit submission skills, grappling skills, came from that sambo background. So definitely credible on the ground. Good everywhere. In his last fight, he did just what he had to do to not like to break that losing streak. He full composed. Was able to keep his boxing clean, keep his striking clean so that his opponent couldn't land any hard shots, land any clean shots. Kept his opponent at the end of his jab just like he should have had, should have. Mixed in combination well. And won a clean cut decision. I think he won all three rounds. 
and it was a clean performance. I think against Tai Tuvasa, though, I'm going to go with Tai Tuvasa in this fight. I feel like his defense will be clean, maybe through the first, but Tai Tuvasa aggression and this the premise that the, how heavy his strikes are, um, Andrelowski might be able to deal with it through the first round, but I think eventually it's going to be like a gradual breakdown process. And eventually, I don't think he'll be able to go three rounds without getting avoided, like three rounds avoiding getting hit by the heavy hands of Tai Tuvasa. I mean, Andrelowski can knock out Tai Tuvasa as well, but I feel at this point in his career, it's just like Andrelowski just not at that point in his career. He's just on a down slope, in my opinion. I feel that. Through, after the first round, Andrelowski might win the first round. But by the second round, Tai Tuvasa will have worn down Andrelowski a bit. His defense will have lowered a bit. And I see that Tai Tuvasa, like Tai Tuvasa will connect. And I see a TKO. So in this fight, I have Tai Tuvasa via second round TKO. Then to our next fight on the main card, we have in the women's featherweight division, Holly Holm versus Megan Anderson. Holly Holm is 1-4 in her last five fights. Not impressive at all, but she still has that name value. And you could at least say that in her last fight, her last loss against Cyborg, she put on a good competitive performance, went five rounds. I think she managed to steal some rounds. Managed to have some good, actually some good things to say about this fight, like some good areas that she looked good in in that fight. Timing was good. She was able to, like she was doing well in the clinch against Cyborg, who was supposed to be the better person in the clinch. She looked good in the clinch. I think she even got, might even got a takedown in the fight. I'm not too sure, but she looked pretty decent in the fight. She held a good account for herself, but a loss is a loss. She lost that fight. I think she has fought in better competition than Megan Anderson by far. Megan Anderson has not even fought in close to the competition that Holly Holm has fought. But I think Holly Holm still will give Megan Anderson some opportunities. Megan Anderson is a big chick, six feet tall. I think Holly Holm is around five, eight, five, nine. Still both big for the weight class, but um, Megan Anderson is certainly taller. I think Holly Holm might be a little bit more filled out for the better opponent, opponent. I think stylistic wise, I think on the feet, Holly Holm is, I think I'm going to say overall, Holly Holm is the fastest opponent, better timing, better striking. But Meg Anderson, I would say, had a better grappling. And uh, grappling is Holly Holm's weak area, in my opinion. Even though it's despite her looking good in grappling and training with all these good coaches, her grappling, at least her grappling IQ is not the best. It might look good in the gym, but in the fight, when she gets taken down, she often makes it worse for herself. She allows people to pass, and she gives up. People, like, just give up position so people would get her back, and just, it never looks good. And she gives up takedowns, not able to get back to her feet a lot. So the ground is pretty much like her quicksand a lot of time. If not for her own, like, predictability that she pretty much has the same style of strikes all the time. And you could say that most fighters, or pretty much every fighter, does the same stuff all the time. But her stuff is too predictable. She doesn't really do set up her her little flurry with without a feint. It's just like she just comes in. She comes from kicking range with punches, then though ends it off with like a kick. So it's like you know what she's gonna do. She might be so good at it that she could still beat a lot of people with it or be effective with it. But a lot of times people are able to counter. That. I don't think Mega Anderson will be one of those people to be able to counter it. She might be able to counter with a takedown. And that could be bad news for Holly Holm. But I think for the most part, Holly Holm's gonna be too fast for her. Be a little bit too much for her. Meg Anderson might be able to get a takedown here and there, but outside of that, I think it'll be at the end of the rounds or where she Holly Holm will get saved by the bill or where Meg Anderson won't really be able to do much success, have much success with those takedowns once she gets her there to score a lot of points to steal around. So I think Holly Holm is going to be too fast, going to be at Atlanta strikes. Her strikes going to be on a different level from Meg Anderson. She's going to be a different level opponent from the people Meg Anderson has faced. I don't see a finish, but I see Holly Holm being able to beat her to the punch. Been able to dictate the fight, use her footwork, foot movement, because she's constantly moving. So those takedowns going to be hard to shoot. And I don't think Meg Anderson like no great um, NCAA caliber wrestler or no Olympic level, no high school standout wrestler. So I don't see her really being able to get these takedowns. She, and she doesn't have the speed, like say, or time of somebody like Valentina. So I don't see the takedowns really coming forward like that. And I see Holly Holm dictating the pace. So in this fight, I have Holly Holm via decision. Then on to our co-main event, we have in the welterweight division, Rafael Dos Anjos, or you can say RDA, versus Kobe Covington. And I'm just going to say RDA. So this is a fight I've been looking forward to predicting even before it was announced. And this might be the fight I've been most interested in predicting more so than any fight this year so far. So a lot of people are picking RDA because they don't like Kobe Covington and also because RDA is on a tear at the, in the welterweight division right now. And I've been thinking about this fight 
ever since Kobe Covington called out RDA when he first came to the welterweight division. I think RDA is has great striking, a lot of power. He might not be that one punch knockout power type of fighter, but certainly heavy hands and he could put a huge value, put like huge, put up huge volume, and he could keep a pace, that same pace the whole fight, that same forward aggression. So very deadly as far as grappling, pretty solid, respectable wrestling, good top grappling. Off his back, I'm not, I'm not too sure. Really haven't seen him there much. And when, usually when he's on his back against a good wrestler, he's like neutralized. And I kind of expect the same in this fight. A lot of people look at Kobe Covenant last fight against Damian Maia. Say Damian Maia was able to look good on his feet, but. Kobe Covenant was just kind of trying to stand with Damian Maia, more worried about Damian Maia getting on top of him. So he's more worried about, he like, he'd rather take the punches than give up a takedown to Damian Maia. So it's a different dynamic. And plus, Damian, Damian Maia's striking is so awkward, so it's hard to judge. With RDA's striking, it might be hard to judge based off how good and clean and good his setups with his striking is, but it's not awkward. So it might be even easier to predict than, say, a Damian Maia who just throws out anything and just comes at you in such an awkward way. And people say um, Kobe Covenant striking is bad, but it's not really that bad. He's been dropping fighters, been taking them down, dominating them everywhere in the fight. It might not be the best, might not be RDA level, but I think he could certainly hold his own on the feet, but he's not going to be one of those fighters that's going to forget what they do. He knows what he, he wants to do. He's a wrestler. He wants to lay on you. He wants to take you down. He wants to dominate you there for three rounds. And I think that's pretty much what he's going to do. You look at, let me just give us, you some fights. So Jason High fight, Jason High might have got knocked out in the second round, but it, in the first round, he I say he dominated RDA in the wrestling. RDA looked helpless on the ground, but I said that's more so that attributed to like RDA, not RDA, but um Jason Hyde getting tired in the second round that he was stopped. He was sweating. He was fatigued in the second round. He was a sitting duck, and he lost. As far as RDA's toughest fight at welterweight so far was his debut, and you could say that was because it was his first fight moving up, but I would say more so because Tarek Safnick gave him some go on the wrestling. He was take, he took him down like once. I think they traded takedowns, maybe one or two. Maybe RDA had one more or two more, but it was certainly grappling and certainly was, that was factor in. And RDA didn't look like he just had that unlimited stamina he used to have because he had to wrestle. And you look at the Khabib fight, Khabib was able to thoroughly dominate him through three rounds with his wrestling. And I say, Kobe Covenant just about as good a wrestler as um, Khabib is, if not better, and he's bigger. And I say his cardio is better. So I'm not saying, that, I'm saying like he could do the same thing to RDA that Khabib did or maybe worse. As far as the RDA beating Robbie Lawler, Rob Lawler just sat there and stood with him and struck. He didn't try to take down, take, do takedowns until he already had his knee damage. And it's not like I would say that Robbie Lawler is the same level of wrestler that um, Kobe Covenant is. So, so, so we're talking about drawing leg kicks and low kicks and body kicks and head kicks. I think the, those all would be setups for Covenant to take him down. Covenant's not going to try to strike with him unless he needs to. And I think he'll be able to be, like, handle himself well on the feet, at least for the limited amount of time he's going to be on the feet. And it's been a three round fight. I think if, if Kobe Covenant could even be half effective with his um, wrestling, he'll be able to steal a lot of rounds just with the takedowns. If you hold him down for one round and keep the striking close enough, he could edge out some rounds. But I'm not even going to say he's just going to edge it out. I'm saying he's going to dominate RDA with his wrestling. Already not gonna be able to prepare to wrestle with somebody like despite how much he trains and all the people he brings in, he still has that deficiency of wrestling. He's still not that good off off his back. And I think that Covenant's gonna use every opportunity that RDA gives to take him down. I think RDA's style is perfect, perfectly like tailor made for a wrestler to dominate him. His strikes are good, but it's not like his jab is phenomenal. His best strikes are his blitz style strikes where he kind of squares up and throws these fast loopy punches, which leaves you open for a takedown. His kick's great, but if you throw a low kick. That's set up for takedown. A body kick, catch that body kick, you get taken down. High kick, so, well, they say high kicks are not really the best for takedown, but I say Kobe would take him down off a high kick too. Any kick you throw, it would be a good setup for Kobe Covenant to take him down. And I say Kobe Covenant will just dominate him on the ground for three rounds. I'm not saying to finish. I think already he's tough, but he's going to take already down, bust him up, and put him on, like give him a, a clinic, a wrestling clinic on him. So in this fight through three rounds, I have Kobe Covington via three round decision. Then on to our main event, we have a middleweight championship rematch, Robert Whitaker versus Joel Romero. And this is a solid ma- rematch, solid matchup. In the first fight, Romero won the earlier rounds, the first two, then pretty much started to fade and lost the last three. So you could say the first fight is really pretty much Romero slowing down that allowed Whitaker to win, more so than 
Whitaker actually changing up the complexion of the fight to do something. It was more so just Romero slowing down. It's just his style. He has he's very fast, very explosive, very muscular. And then he's he's not the youngest fighter. He's basically forty or is forty, and muscly. So he's not gonna be expected to have the best cardio. He has a very limited gas tank, but he's very explosive, very athletic. So he slows down. He slows down in later rounds. And you could say that he improved his style a little bit, showed some new wrinkles against Rocco. And I think he did. I think he has some improvement. But I think for the most part, he's the same guy. And Whitaker even acknowledged that at this age, Romero is not going to learn any new tricks. He might be able to adjust himself a little bit, but he's not going to learn anything new. He's not going to be a different fighter. He's not going to change up that much. And I think he's, he was right about that. I think um, even though he was able to fight like that against Rocco, Rocco's style is he fights for range, especially in the UFC. Maybe in the strike force days, he was more aggressive. But in the UFC, he's a, he uses his range a lot more, and he just fights a slower pace of fight. He might be able to finish people quick at times, but more so he just kind of picks people apart from a, from a range. It's, it's like a more moderate to slow pace and not a fast pace. Whereas Whitaker, you're not going to really be able to fight that same fight because Whitaker is trying to knock your head off from the, the, the first bell to the last bell. He's trying to knock you out. He's going for that strike. He's much faster than Rocco. His box is much better than Rocco. It's a different frame you're dealing with. You're dealing with a fighter that's around the same height as you. You're not dealing with that long, long fight, like that long, tall fighter. You're fighting with a fighter that's going to get in your face and needs to get in your face to hurt you. He's going to be trying to come at you with these punches, come at you nonstop, and has a lot of energy, a lot of gas, young, and all this, these attributes that kind of factor against you and good takedown defense. And even when you take him down, he springs right back up. So it's definitely a difficult challenge. Romero had himself good in the first fight. I think he'll have himself good in this fight. But like always, I tend to go with the fighter who won before. So I'm leaning towards Whitaker. He beat him before. He'll beat him again. And it... Just because he beat him like once doesn't mean he's going to come back the same way. Just like Romero can improve, Whitaker can improve. He has he's been out with an injury. The knee might be a good opening, like good place to attack in this fight. But even in the first fight, um, Whitaker was able to adjust and stop Romero from attacking his knees after like maybe the first or second round. So it's going to be a another close fight in my opinion. I think Romero might win the first round rounds again, but I'm going to say it's going to kind of alternate rounds. I say. Remember, we'll probably win in like May 1st, 3rd. But I'm not saying second rounds, but it's going to be competitive. Close rounds could go out of the way throughout the first maybe three rounds. But in the later rounds, I feel like Romero's still going to slow down because he's dealing with that high pace. Whitaker's going to be in his face trying to land those head kicks. He's going to be trying to land those feints, coming in with those straights, those jabs. He's going to be coming in aggressive the whole time. And Romero's going to have to move his head unless he could counter Whitaker and make him respect him or land some takedowns and actually get some effective ground and pound. But that's going to be difficult because, I mean, Romero comes from a Olympic style of wrestling instead of a freestyle. So he's not used to wrestling right. He's not very good at holding people down with minimal energy. He would exhaust a lot of energy trying to hold somebody down. So that's not going to really factor in and well against Whitaker. I think Whitaker is going to be able to spring back up. And Romero's not going to really be able to land much damage on the ground, spend much time on the ground. On the feet, Romero will hold his own. I say and probably still win, some, win a round or two just off the, in the standing department. He might he probably will score about two or three takedowns throughout the fight, but nothing that would change the course of the fight. And he is gonna be too young, too fast, and it's just like he's gonna just ride his time right now. He's the champion. I think despite him being out for this time, I think he's gonna make improvements. And it's not even gonna be the same fight. He's gonna be a better fighter than he was the first time, where Romero's gonna be just a slightly better fighter than he was the first time. But I see it playing out is another decision. I think they'll win like I said, they'll trade rounds, but Whitaker will just keep it even. Then when they get to the the championship rounds, Whitaker will just take the fight to his direction, and it's going to be a landslide again. And I see Whitaker winning via decision. So after five rounds, I have Whitaker, Robert Whitaker, winning this fight via decision. And that concludes my fight predictions for UFC 225, Whitaker versus Romero. Two. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe, and come back for more videos. Peace.